Thank you, Gautam. So when I told Gautam that uh, I wanted to be in the movies, he looked here. I told him I want to do the marathon, he looked here. <laughs> Life is hard for an out-of-shape dude, man. <clears throat> so, um, so I work for Real Image. We are an entertainment technology company based in India, headquartered out of Chennai. Uh, we've been doing it for about 30 years. Um, our, our latest product is Just Tickets, which is a movie ticketing website, uh, the back end of which actually uses Go. And before that, uh, we created Cube Cinema, which is a digital cinema platform. Digital cinema as in playing movies digitally in theaters. And uh, we have about 5,000 screens in the world, and, and all of the media streaming code was done in C and C++, as you would imagine. But listening to all of the talks today, uh, I've just decided that we're going to port it all to Go, because it looks like Go can make bad movies look good. And you see, one of the reasons why C++ was so popular was because it had few acceleration features like vectorization or calling into GPU accelerated code. It's not something that you can do with Go today. So that, that's another place where you would, you would want to use C code and use C Go to make that transition from Go to C. So <clears throat> let's do a quick uh, walkthrough of uh, calling to some C code. So I'm sure everybody's looked at this code at some point in their life. Uh, so that's standard C code. And uh, to convert this to uh, Go, we'll start adding the obligatory package main. Um, the next thing is very interesting. You actually comment out all of the C code, right? <laughs> so normally you do this to get code away from execution, right? Uh, the Go uh, designers seem to think that maybe they hated C, right? So comment it so that we'll consider it for processing. So you basically comment your code and then, uh, my formatting is messed up, right below the comment you have a import C and C is actually a pseudo package and this import C line uh, basically uh, signals uh, to the tool chain that everything that precedes me in the comment is to be handled as C code. And finally, that's a, a little piece of Go code there that's calling the main function uh, in the C package. So that's, uh, that's an example of where C Go comes into action. So all the magic happens when you run Go build. So you build it no different from uh, code, uh, regular, uh, regular Go code. So when you do Go code, what happens is uh, when the tool chain sees the import C, it triggers C Go. And, uh, and what happens is uh, there are some Go files that get generated and there are some C files that get generated. And uh, any non-Go files in the directories considered for compilation, so C or C++ code, will also get handed off to a C, uh, C or C++ compiler. And uh, you can also, to a certain extent, control the uh, compiler and the linker by using these, these hash C go pseudo directives uh, in your code. So let's look at uh, some of these uh, generated code. So you're going to be looking at a fair amount of code today. So anytime you don't see syntax coloring, that's all generated code. OK. So um, except for the comments which I added, so they look right. So, um, <clears throat> so what's happening here is that um, the function main uh, that you wrote in Go, which is basically uh, having one line that's calling uh, main from the, uh, from the C package, um, is rewritten into a function um, C func underscore underscore main in this case, and so, so basically, the, the, the package dot function name notation is gone. You just see underscoring there. And uh, there's another Go function that is uh, generated in a different file, which basically uh, calls this uh, C Go call uh, runtime function where actually all of the magic happens. So basically, what you're seeing there is uh, there's code generator that's called, that calls C Go call with a pointer to a function and a pointer to the stack frame for the function. So the dotted line there is actually making the transition over from Go to C. And uh, so this is, again, a, a wrapper that's generated for your C function. 
And uh, the C function that we wrote is unchanged. So it made it, uh, it, made it unscathed to uh, a C file, but there is a wrapper function that gets called. And, and the most important thing, or the interesting thing here is that it actually ends up calling the C function that we wrote. And everything around there is basically uh, adapting the differences in calling conventions between, um, between Go and, and C. So uh, really what happens is things are going from uh, purely stack-based calling to maybe registers and stack combinations. So that's what's happening here. <clears throat> um, so this is the direction of going from Go to C. Uh, you can also call back from C into Go. So here I have an example of uh, uh, a fill function that works on a large payload, but as it's working on a large payload, it can periodically call a callback function to notify itself of progress. So this uh, function is actually called from a Go code. So c.fill actually ends up calling uh, the C code, and then, and then uh, periodically it calls this function called progress, which is actually a Go function. Okay? The way that the Go function was made available for C is with this comment again. So slash slash export, function name before a function signals that this is a function that needs to be exported out to be called back from, um, from C. <clears throat> so here again, when you do go build, um, C go generates some C wrappers. Um, again, the magic happens in uh, a runtime uh, function called C go callback, callback. And there's, a, there's actually two different compilers that get, uh, get in the mix today. There is a compiler that comes, C compiler that actually comes as part of the uh, Go tool chain. Um, it's like a Plan 9 C compiler. And then there is a GCC or a Clang that, that normally comes into picture. So there is also that bridging that happens here. <clears throat> so calling back into Go code uh, would give us the notion that, wow, callbacks are supported. Call, they call it callbacks, but ideally, <clears throat> if you look at uh, this function here, I've written a C function that actually hard codes the name of a Go function, right? And it was all okay because I was having it in the same source file. It was the same developer that wrote both, but that's probably not the case uh, most of the time. So that is not a great way to do it. Real programmers do it that way, right? They take a function pointer to be used as the callback function. So this way, uh, your C function is not making any assumption as to what that function is going to be called. So if that function were written uh, the right way, then you would just call c.fill, passing uh, a pointer to the progress function that's implemented in Go. Unfortunately, this code would not compile. Um, because what C gets is a wrapper, right? The wrapper that we saw earlier. So this is not going to this is not going to work. So there is a there is an okay solution for this problem. Uh, all my rectangles are looking wrong. So what you would have to do in this case is, if you wanted to keep your fill function uh, that takes a callback pointer, you would have to write a wrapper function in C that knows about your uh, exported progress function in Go. And that's the guy that actually passes uh, a pointer to the callback function to the real one. So assume that this was written by another developer. It's in another, uh, another source file that you don't have access to. So you'd end, you'll actually end up writing wrappers uh, to make it work like a true callback. <clears throat> so a couple of notes about uh, those two functions where uh, I was mentioning that all the magic happens. Uh, you go from Go to C using um, C Go call. It was actually mentioned in an earlier talk. Um, <clears throat> so what C Go call does, among other things, is that it, it treats your call or the execution of the C code just like it would treat uh, any syscall. Um, so which would mean that the syscall blocking is not going to block other Go routines or uh, the garbage collector. 
It also switches the stack to an operating system allocated stack because GoRoutines usually get their own little stack. Uh, but that stack is probably not going to work for uh, a GCC compiled code. So uh, Sego call takes care of that. And the side effect of this is that uh, your C code execution is all outside of uh, GoMax procs accounting. So it doesn't pay attention to that. <clears throat> when you do C go callback, the reverse happens because you're now coming back from C code into Go code. Uh, it makes sure that you're switching to the Go routine stack that Go routines like. And Go Maxbox accounting comes into play there. So all of this infrastructure is also very recursion aware. So you could go from Go to C, back to Go, back to C, till your work is done or you run out of stack, stack space. But as you've seen in the wrappers, and looking at what's happening here, these function calls are not cheap. So, so if, you're, if you're, your pattern of usage should be where you're passing a large payload and having it do a lot of work, as opposed to passing small payloads numerous times. So you don't incur the cost of make, crossing the chasm. <clears throat> I learned most of all I'm talking today by looking at uh, the source code, which happens to be implemented in Go, C, and Assembly. So, pretty hardcore stuff. So, uh, my uh, impressions on Seago, it is, um, I have not seen, uh, I've actually worked with multiple languages that actually, you know, cross from their own little silo to C, and none of them do this as smoothly, right? So, I was, I was showing you examples where we actually had a few lines of C code. Uh, you don't need to. Uh, do that for many cases. So you could just uh, have hash include stdio.h, and you could just do c.gets, or some of those functions. You can't call c.printf because printf takes variable arguments, but why do you need to? Because you have fun. Um, <clears throat> but, but it's very quick, very easy to get started. But I would think that any non-trivial binding code, like for example, the SQLite uh, Binding code. I've, I've taken a look at it. There is uh, there is some amount of C code that you have to write to bridge uh, the differences. You've seen that callbacks can be a little cumbersome. They are not. Uh, they don't work uh, as we naturally expect them to. Um, I haven't experienced this problem myself, but I've read that uh, using C Go basically prevents cross-platform builds from happening. And apparently, there is a workaround in the GCC Go uh, tool chain, but not in the standard one. Compile times, which, is, which seems to be a huge feature of Go, right? Faster compile times. Just this hello world example that I was showing you was 10x lower because it was including all of stdio.h, and there were probably thousands and thousands of lines of code that the C compiler had to go through. Well, GC, um, <clears throat> C does not know about garbage collection, so you have to be careful when some, here is an example of that same function called as a go routine. So the garbage collector is not going to realize that uh, the nums uh, slice actually escaped uh, into C world. So it's going to collect it when it has to collect it, and you could still be using it in your uh, C code. Uh, so look out for garbage collection gotchas. And, uh, and I'm reading a lot about uh, 1.5 not going to have any C code in the runtime. and. Uh, going to completely get rid of the uh, C compiler, the, the Plan 9 C compiler that ships with it. So, um, and, and I see that people misunderstand that as uh, C go going away. I don't think C go will ever go away because you always have the need to uh, interface with the legacy libraries and the other examples we pointed out. So what's, what I see happening is that the, the Go tool chain, the Go runtime is going to be devoid of C code and it's going to be all in Go. That's it. That's, I have included some pointers to how I learned about all of these, so I think we have time for questions.